originally I'm or originally Polish, but I've been living in Belgium for more than 10 years now. And uh, as uh, Lindy has mentioned, I did research at the beginning uh, for ESIP uh, in, in, ter in terms of trade policy, but recently I've been doing management and communication here. So I'll be helping today and I help uh, Lindy facilitate this discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalia. We're really excited you're here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a quick presentation here. Um, like, like I mentioned, we're going to go over a little bit about strategic planning. Specifically today, we're going to get into the strategic planning tool known as the SWOT analysis. A lot of you have probably heard of the SWOT analysis before, um, especially if you've done any Atlas Network Academy training with us. Um, and then we're going to go into breakout rooms for a long time. We're going to be in there for about 30 minutes, really talking through what does a SWOT analysis look like for the region of Europe. So today we're going to be doing a regional focused SWOT analysis, and then we're going to come back and have Natalia talk us through what she saw in the breakout rooms and, you know, the situation of the liberty movement in Europe. Um, so we've talked with Natalia, we know what she's all about, and I wanted to explain a little bit about why we're doing this session. This is a little bit of a different session from what you've experienced at the Europe Liberty Forum so far. Um, but this is part of an Atlas Network Academy training that we're doing. Um, some of you in this room are members of that training cohort, our Think Tank 360 training. And this is part of what they've been learning throughout the training, how to strategic plan for their organization and how to take these skills and really up level what they're doing. So each of us in this room has a very different skill set. You know, all of us come from different countries and different areas, and we all have something different to offer when it comes to looking at the region of Europe as a whole and strengthening the liberty movement in Europe. Here at Atlas Network, we're all about making connections. And, you know, if we were in person in Sofia, Bulgaria this year, we would be having these chats over lunch or over coffee, but Zoom is the next best thing, and so we're going to have these chats in our virtual Zoom rooms around the virtual lunch table. Strategic planning is a tool, or strategic planning is something that comes in many shapes and sizes. When you think about your strategy as an organization, there's a lot of different tools that can come to mind. Um, strategic planning is something that should be done regularly. We should all be thinking about our strategy as an organization, and the SWOT analysis is really just one way of doing this. At the Atlas Network Academy, we like the SWOT analysis because it's a pretty simple tool, it's a pretty easy tool, but it's something that can give us a lot of benefits. You know, if you don't know what a SWOT analysis is, SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And taking some time to look at what strengths you have, what weaknesses you have, and then looking at you know, the opportunities that are around you, what can you grasp as an organization, as an individual, or you know, even today, like we're going to do as a region. Um, and so the SWOT analysis really helps you decide kind of what you will do as an organization, but more importantly, what you won't do. In the Atlas Network Academy, we talk a lot about how easy it is for us as organizations to want to do everything, right? We want to solve, all the problems that we see in our region and so it's easy to try and do projects or go out and do everything but because of the different strengths that we have in the region we don't have to do everything by ourselves the SWOT analysis can really help illuminate the fact that you as an individual or as an organization you don't have to do everything on your own so quickly i'd like to take the temperature of the room and see who has done a SWOT analysis before? I'm imagining it's it's a lot of you, but I'd like to know, um, have you done a SWOT analysis before? I'm gonna pull up a poll here on the screen and just click yes or no. Let us know if you've done a SWOT analysis. Awesome, pretty good mix. Looks like we have a lot of people that have done one, a couple people who've never done it. That's awesome. Yeah, good deal, okay. Well, it looks like we have about an 80-20 split, about 80% of us have conducted a SWOT analysis, an analysis before, which is awesome. Um, this SWOT analysis that we're going to be doing today is just a little bit different from ones that you've probably conducted in the past. 
And if you haven't done a SWOT analysis, well, welcome. This is the perfect time to start learning how to use this strategic tool. Um, to conduct a SWOT analysis, the number one thing that I want to mention is you have to be honest with yourself. Um, and you have to be honest about your strengths, but most importantly, about your weaknesses. I think when I'm conducting a SWOT analysis, it's so easy to look at all of my strengths and really play those up and say, wow, I'm really good at this and this. And then when it comes to the weaknesses, I don't really want to talk about those, don't really want to list those. But in order for this tool to be really effective for your organization and for you, you have to be honest. Um, you know, ask anyone who's done a SWOT analysis before, if you're not honest about your weaknesses and about the threats that you see in the region, then the tool's probably not going to be really helpful to you. So remember that as you go into your breakout rooms and as you're conducting some of these things, honesty is everything. You have to be honest with yourself. The one great thing that I love about the SWOT analysis is it's really scalable. So today, like I said, we're doing a region-wide SWOT analysis, which is huge. You know, we're going to look at the entire region of Europe and try to get all of that into a SWOT analysis. But the SWOT analysis can also be used for your organization. It can be used for your team at your organization, or you can do it for a project. So it's a really useful tool. And I hope that, you know, after today, you can take this tool and use it at your organization to look at, you know, what should we do in the future and maybe what shouldn't we do. Like I mentioned, SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you know, these are pretty self-explanatory, but we're gonna look at an example here of what this could look like for the region of Europe. So when you're in your breakout rooms, we'll be talking through what are some strengths. A strength could be something like, you know, we have a lot of effective think tanks in a variety of countries. Right, if we think about you know, our host, the um, IME in Bulgaria, and we think about Natalia's organization, ESIPE, those are amazing, effective think tanks in the region of Europe, and that's a huge strength. When you're thinking about strengths, maybe ask yourself, you know, what are some organizations really good at? What aspects of liberty are, are accepted by the region? Sometimes it's hard to see that the region is accepting liberty, but look at what are people really accepting here? Then we get to weaknesses. And the weakness that I've put up on this screen is something that we see around the world, right? No matter what region, but it can be difficult to fundraise. It can be difficult to tap into that culture of philanthropy. So I'm sure that'll be a weakness that shows up on your SWOT analysis at some point. Um, but when you're thinking about other weaknesses, think about what activities are we not pursuing as a region? Think about, you know, what activities are people just not responding to? You know, maybe there's a podcast and people in the region just aren't listening to that podcast. So think about some of those questions as you start to look at the weaknesses. Then we get to the opportunities. And this, this is my favorite section of the SWOT analysis because we get to look at the entire region and look at what's out there and what can we take advantage of. The example that we have listed here is, you know, there might be an enormous number of individuals eager for change in the region. And I think we see this, especially in Europe. But as you're thinking about opportunities, ask yourself what groups, you know, non-GOs, think tanks, what organizations might be sympathetic to the cause of liberty? Think about what people want to see improved. Is there, you know, an attitude in the region waiting for change? And then look at intercountry cooperation. You know, maybe we have some of that happening. And then finally, we get to the threats. And threats are hard because they're the things that are really outside of your control. You know, you can't control if there are tensions between countries, right? So when you're thinking about threats, ask yourself, you know, what competitors are working against you as an organization or in the region? And then what major changes are people against? It's important to take the temperature of you know, the people that you're, you're talking to. And then think about conflict between countries or groups in the region. Um, threats, like I said, they're really outside of your control and they're, they're hard to pin down sometimes, but I think it's important that we acknowledge those and put those on our SWOT analysis. So we're gonna go into breakout rooms in just a little bit, but 
look at this example, think through some of these questions, and start to think about what can you bring to your breakout room. Natalia is going to be hopping in and out of breakout rooms and giving her perspective on what she sees. So get ready for that. I think we're going to send people into breakout rooms in just a minute, but this is what I want you to do. Discuss the strengths, right? Discuss the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that you see in the region of Europe. And then as Natalia, you know, jumps in and out of your breakout room, make sure to talk with her about, are you on the right track? You know, does she see something maybe that you don't see? And then if you have time, you know, we, we're running up on a clock here, but if you have time, talk through how the different talents in the room can work together to grasp some of these opportunities and overcome these threats. Um, like I said, we're all about making connections and this is an area where you really can do that. Um, look at your strengths, look at your you know, peers' strengths and see if you can work together. So all right, if we're ready to go into breakout rooms, you should see that pop up on your screen. Join a breakout room and we will be back here in just about 30 minutes.
All right, looks like people are coming back from our breakout rooms. All right. Well, I hope that you guys had amazing discussions and that you were able to, you know, connect with one another and talk through some of the strengths that you have to offer the region and maybe hopefully you found ways that you can collaborate with one another. Um, Natalia, I'd be really interested now to hear about what you saw in the breakout rooms and maybe you can give us, you know, a debrief of what you saw and then some more on how you think the liberty movement looks in Europe and, and what we can do to, to strengthen it. Okay. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. So I will try to do a summary. It was a lot of interesting things. Um, and there's so many different things. So I'm going to go SWOT as by clockwise and try to give you some uh, overview of what has been discussed so that if you haven't heard from me yet in the breakout room from the other breakout rooms, you can hear it now. So I think there's a lot of strengths uh, in Europe that were identified. First of all, uh, Glenn mentioned we have a lot of talent and a lot of knowledge in Europe among so many countries, so many organizations, we can share it. So basically, even if one organization doesn't necessarily know or has an uh, expertise, one thing we can learn from each other and we can pull these experiences, which I think is a big strength. Um, also, despite the COVID and all the mess that came up with this, we managed to adapt very easily and we were still able to cooperate even virtually, um, which, was, is, which is a strength for organization like ours. Um, there is also a very good infrastructure in Europe. Obviously, we are very well connected in general, despite the travel restrictions right now, we're hoping that it's going to be <laughs> over soon, but uh, that's something that's good. With this closeness and the cooperation, there's also a strong sense of community in Europe uh, that everyone feels so that uh, we can always rely on each other and now through the ATLAX, we can contact them in case we need help. Um, from more political perspective, uh, something that they there's a strong opinion that the rules of law will prevail despite certain democracy uh, aspects and freedoms aspect that we were under attack during the COVID but there is a still strong democratic values in Europe and that's helping um, uh, the the liberty movement to to move forward and obviously the online presence is a strength so uh infrastructure it taps into this because a lot of people are connected so that's not that difficult to um to reach others even if we cannot meet offline for the weaknesses we also have few um and basically i will focus more on generally right now and i think that might be a weakness it's uh basically the motor of different languages in Europe. So it's very difficult to work on the globe, on European level sometimes when you need to tap into your local politicians and local parties and local government. So that's also a, a weakness that, for example, the Americans won't experience. Um, another is high taxation uh, and the people and many citizens that are more left leaning. Um, so basically that also limits a little bit of possibility of funding, which was one of the main weaknesses as well identified by many groups. So there is, first of all, not that many civil um, awareness of donating for organizations like ours. There's also a lack of uh, established foundation in many countries. It also different between the North, South, East, West, also EU, non-EU member states. So that's basically the kind of diversification could be a weakness for liberty movement like this, because not everyone can tap into the same funding opportunities than the others. Um, we also, European is also very regulated uh, in general. Um, so there's a lot of obstacles to go over actually to deregulate it for the liberty movement. There's a tendency to regulate in Europe that you don't necessarily have in the States. Um, and I think those are the, uh, the main one for the week, I think some of the weaknesses and the situation in Europe can actually be taken as an opportunity. Um, so we were talking into uh, sharing the best practices, learning from each other, uh, being better with sharing through 
even not necessarily formal networks like Atlas, but informal groups. There is a Telegram mention, I think, Facebook, LinkedIn to basically share with each other. Uh, the changes post COVID also can open certain possibilities because there is this urge to restart the economy, the businesses. What I can add for myself, I think it's a good opportunity right now uh, because the businesses are so afraid of the regulations, they are actually willing to donate money for rebellion and pro market uh, free trade organization because they just like, I think, in my opinion, they are scared <laughs> what's going after um, and what's going to happen to them. Um, what else do I have here? Um, uh, I think there's also someone mentioned that in certain countries when the governments were prevailing and basically taking care of your life with the COVID people realized it's not up to them to make a change. So there is this change in mentality in certain countries when people don't necessarily rely on government, but they want to change. And I think this is something that organization like ours can tap into, whether it is in the academic environment, civil society, or even business community. So I think th those are the, the opportunities we have. Um, for the threats, obviously it's nothing uh, unexpected is the populism. In Europe, obviously, we have um, a lot of populistic party, even that the UK left, uh, they are new coming or they're becoming bigger, the radicalization in center member states. A lot of threats are also different depending which part of Europe you're coming from, whether it's north, south, east, west, but in general tendencies that capitalism is not the best solutions are growing. Um, so that's also leads to the problems when we have difficulties explaining the movement and our values to people because there's so many information often called propaganda even from all these left parties uh, that are basically prevailing in social media which is another threat basically uh, caused by the misinformation and overtaken by not necessarily european actors our social media channel targeting younger population um, and also, the travel restriction was put as a threat because we'll see, you know, European Union is coming up with solution within the Schengen area, but we are also talking with a lot of organizations who are not necessarily in Europe. You know, we have different vaccinations approval in different member states. We'll see how it goes. So that might be a threat because I think for a lot of organizations and also actors like ours, it would be good to meet in person as well or to reach out to the government employees in person sometimes or the European stakeholders as well. Um, so that's basically, I think, a summary. Obviously there are notes being taken and there's a lot more and I think it was super interesting discussion. What I just wanted to add, it's not much, just um, what I'm also afraid of, for example, is a talent brain from Europe. We have a lot of talent, but a lot of this talent are moving in different direction. Europe is not becoming an interesting continent. For example, we are also going to suffer some demographic changes in Europe. We will be missing experts, innovators, especially when we're talking, for example, digital technology and digital transformation. I think this is a threat that a lot of countries in Europe will have to face uh, and will have to deal with this. Um, and yeah, I don't know if you have any questions, but I hope the summary <laughs> was useful. That's amazing. Thank you, Natalia. And I think you hit it right on the head. There are just so many opportunities for cooperation and collaboration with one another. And I hope that this session illuminated that for you. Um, one thing that we at Atlas Network really love to do is find ways to keep these conversations going. Um, and I know Natalia, we'll, we'll share our email addresses here in a minute, and I know she'd love to hear from you, but we have a couple of minutes now. If anybody has any questions for Natalia, um, based on what you talked about in your breakout room, you can put those into the chat and we can answer those now. So if anybody has any questions, one thing Natalia that I wanted to ask you is when you're looking at the threats and kind of that talent leaving Europe, are there things that we as civil society organizations can do to start to overcome that? Yes, I think everyone has a role to play, right? So I think it was mentioned to reach out to the academics. Uh, 
uh, to, to universities to tap into this potential. I think also it's important if someone does like us, we are the trade and digital think tank, we're looking into the future, what jobs might be, you know, in, in which direction the economy is going, what jobs we're going to use. I think it's very important to highlight to the policymakers that there are certain sectors that will be understaffed. And we either need to change our migration policies or we need to change our education system to make sure we will have this people there because otherwise we are will be losing the advantage and especially when you didn't have this problem as such when the trump was a president and he basically blocked a lot of migration into the united states but as i understand uh president biden has a little bit much, uh, much more open approach and they realize the problems i think we will have to be talking about it i think migration within in europe is one thing but also we have all the neighbor states we have all the Association, uh, associate countries with the partnership agreements, we should be facilitating this. It's also a brain dump for them, but also we need to kind of find a way uh, that they will give back to the society as well. Because um, as I'm originally Polish, I can see the move from basically east to west of an employees um, and on different levels, skilled, unskilled, low house level. And I think it's going to continue at some point. Um, but we, especially in Countries like Poland, I think Ukraine is also having the problem. Uh, it's important to talk to the to the stakeholders, the policymakers, uh, to, to find some kind of regulations to keep those people in countries as well. I know from the Poland perspective, uh, there is a lot of discussion about tax employment, you know, income, uh, all these regulations, just to make sure that like we don't lose the. Uh, the high specialist because of the high basically wage cost because for them it would especially now with the digital thing a lot of people can live and work from many different places so for high level specialists that's becoming a challenge so I think for every organization there is it's important to make sure that they address this issue at some point so that we don't lose this talent yeah I completely agree um I know there are other questions here in the chat, but we have to wrap up so that we can get to our next session. If you see on the screen here, um, Natalia has very generously offered to share her email address with us. My email address is on there as well. Let's keep these conversations going. Um, we have a really great opportunity to connect with one another on the Liberty Forum platform, either through direct message, or I think you can even call each other on there. So keep these collaborations going. Natalia mentioned this is so crucial to overcoming these threats and grasping these opportunities. So keep the conversation going. Um, also, we would love to have you join us at the Atlas Network Academy for more trainings um, similar to this one. You know, we have a lot of leadership development trainings. We have new certifications that you can get. And so I would encourage you to head to ana.atlasnetwork.org and check out some more of the trainings um, that we have to offer. We have to go to our next session now. It's the closing session of the Europe Liberty Forum. So I'll give you all just a minute to hop onto that. But Natalia, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all of you. It's so nice to see your faces on our virtual Zoom screen here. And we're hoping that we can be back having these conversations with you in person very soon. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you at the next session. Thank you very much.